Head of Trade, uh, based in Canberra. Uh, good to see a number of familiar faces in the audience when I was down here uh, last May. Let me also introduce Claire Ouellette. Uh, Claire is a colleague from the Defence Export Control Organisation. Uh, if we have people here who are involved in defence exports, you're probably very aware that we have sanctions regimes that look at particular countries, but then we also have a separate regime that uh, regulates the export of defence goods to any country. And uh, naturally enough, those two regimes intersect if you're exporting defence goods to a sanctioned country. So uh, while well, I'll just talk about sanctions today, if there are any questions about defence goods, then Claire will be very happy to take those as well uh, at the end of my presentation. Look, I'll aim to do five things today. Uh, some of these will be a little familiar to those of you who were here uh, last May. Firstly, I'll give a general introduction to the sanctions regimes that Australia implements. Uh, secondly, I'll run through some particular sanctions measures that we implement within the sanctions regime. Uh, thirdly, I'll talk about sanctions permits and how you can get one to authorise an activity that might otherwise contravene sanctions. Uh, fourthly, I'll talk about sanctions offences. Uh, it's important to understand the context of sanctions as Australian criminal law. And uh, fifthly and finally, I'll run through what it is that Australian businesses really need to know and do uh, when it comes to sanctions. Um, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm very happy to take questions as we, uh, as we go along. So to start then with a general introduction to sanctions regimes, uh, what are sanctions? The Charter of the United Nations doesn't actually use the term sanctions anywhere, but Article 41 of the Charter uh, in essence defines what we mean when we talk about sanctions. It refers to measures not involving the use of armed force, including complete or partial interruption of economic relations. Uh, we passed the Autonomous Sanctions Act in 2011. Uh, when it was still at the stage of being a bill in 2010, we released an explanatory memorandum outlining what the, uh, the bill would do. Um, that included a slightly more elongated, but nonetheless very consistent uh, definition of sanctions. So what are the aims of sanctions? Again, referring to that explanatory memorandum from the Autonomous Sanctions Bill of 2010, uh, we normally refer to three aims. The first is to limit the adverse consequences of a situation of international concern. The second is to seek to influence those responsible for giving rise to that situation. And the third is to penalise those responsible. In Australia, we implement two different types of sanctions regimes. Uh, the first is United Nations Security Council, or UNSC, sanctions regimes. Uh, these are imposed by the UNSC in response to a threat to the peace, a breach of the peace, or an act of aggression. And then once they're imposed by the UNSC, it's incumbent upon all UN member states, naturally including Australia, to implement those sanctions as a matter of international law. Uh, so we have no room to move when it comes to implementing UNSC sanctions regimes. The second type of sanctions regime that we have in Australia uh, is Australian Autonomous Sanctions Regimes. Uh, these are both uh, imposed and implemented purely by the Australian Government uh, as a matter of our foreign policy. Um, the autonomous sanctions that we implement may supplement UNSC sanctions, so there are a number of instances where the UNSC has been willing to go a certain distance down a road to sanctioning a country. Uh, the Australian Government has had additional concerns and so has chosen to go further down that road through our autonomous sanctions. Or alternatively, autonomous sanctions might be entirely separate from UNSC sanctions and there are a range of sanctions regimes we've implemented autonomously where the UNSC has had nothing to say about that particular country. I should note that with autonomous sanctions we, we typically move in lockstep with uh, like-minded countries around the world. We look in particular to Canada, the EU and the US. Uh, and you'll see that our autonomous sanctions in many ways mirror uh, the autonomous sanctions of those countries and vice versa. Uh, this diagram shows the current sanctions regimes that we implement, a total of 24 regimes at the moment. Um, we put together this slide, I think, last Thursday. It came out of date on Friday. Uh, the UNSC, uh, last Friday, New York time, uh, adopted a new sanctions regime in relation to Yemen. Uh, so that we're in the process of implementing that domestically and we'll need to add it to uh, this diagram very shortly. 
And I draw your attention to the, the overlap of the, of the two circles there. We implement both UNSC sanctions and also autonomous sanctions in relation to three countries, uh, North Korea, uh, Iran, and Libya. We implement all of these sanctions, UNSC or autonomous, through Australian sanction laws. Uh, UNSC sanctions regimes are primarily implemented under the Charter of the United Nations Act 1945 and its various sets of regulations. Uh, there's a separate set of regulations for each UNSC sanctions regime. And the Charter of the United Nations Act, or Katrina to its friends, uh, is administered by us in foreign affairs and trade. Uh, Australian autonomous sanctions, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly given the name of the Act, are primarily implemented under the Autonomous Sanctions Act of 2011 uh, and the Autonomous Sanctions Regulations of the same year. Uh, there's only one set of regulations for autonomous sanctions, and we use that one set to implement all of our autonomous sanctions regimes. Uh, like Katrina, the Autonomous Sanctions Act is also administered by DFAT. Uh, that was an innovation that we brought in in 2011 with the Autonomous Sanctions Act uh, to ensure that all sanctions, UNSC or autonomous, are administered by DFAT. Uh, we hope that makes it much easier for business in particular. We are, we're a one-stop shop for, for sanctions issues now. Uh, it also, incidentally, makes life much easier for us, so uh, it seems to be a win-win. With that by way of uh, an introduction to the sanctions regimes that we implement in Australia. Uh, let me turn to the second part of my presentation and uh, talk a bit about some of the particular sanctions measures that we implement within our sanctions regimes. Uh, importantly, this, this is another innovation of the Autonomous Sanctions Act of 2011. Uh, Katrina and that act use the same terms to describe sanctions measures. Again, we hope this makes it simpler for businesses to comply with sanctions and that we can talk the same language regardless of whether we're discussing UNSC sanctions or we're talking uh, about Australian autonomous sanctions. Uh, different sanctions regimes impose different sanctions measures. As you would expect, they are tailored to the particular situation of, of international concern. So it is important to understand the detail of the particular sanctions regime that you might be dealing with. <coughs> but the types of sanctions measures that are uh, included uh, may include general prohibitions on, for example, making a sanctioned supply of export sanctioned goods, and those terms in quotations are the terms used in our various pieces of legislation. Uh, making a sanctioned import of import sanctioned goods, providing a sanctioned service, engaging in a sanctioned commercial activity, dealing with a designated person or entity, using or dealing with a controlled asset, uh, or the entry into or transit through Australia of a designated or declared person. Uh, while it's not formally uh, a sanctions measure, uh, I know we have a number of representatives of the financial sector here today. You'll be very familiar with this as an anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing measure. There is also a general prohibition on financial transactions of $20,000 or more uh, with Iran. While it's not formally a sanctions measure, if you're exporting goods to Iran that might fall foul of sanctions, there's a very good chance the underlying financial transaction is worth $20,000 or more. Uh, so these crop up in the same circumstances, hence we cover, the, uh, cover this prohibition in our sanctions presentations as well. So I'll run through in a little more detail uh, the most common of these sanctions measures about which we receive inquiries. I'll use Iran as a case study for that, uh, partially because we receive more inquiries about Iran than we do any other country, uh, and partially because, if you remember back to that diagram uh, three or four slides ago, Iran is one of those countries for which we implement both UNSC and Australian autonomous sanctions regimes. So it's a complex, meaty example to, uh, to draw upon. Looking first then at uh, making a sanctioned supply to Iran. This is a prohibition that exists both in UNSC sanctions and in Australian autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran. And a person makes a sanctioned supply if the person supplies, sells, or transfers goods to another person. Uh, the goods are export sanctioned goods, 
and as a direct or indirect result of the supply, sale or transfer, the goods are transferred to Quran. Uh, just note the breadth of the prohibition here, it does extend to the indirect supply of goods to Iran, which means that we're most certainly interested in trades that you may be undertaking involving multiple intermediaries where perhaps the final end user uh, is in Iran. Uh, that definition of making a sanctioned supply uh, rather begs the question of what is an export sanction good. There are some differences for UNSC sanctions compared to autonomous sanctions. For UNSC sanctions in relation to Iran, export sanctioned goods are defined by reference to various UNSC and International Atomic Energy Agency documents. And you can find those listed on our website uh, or of course in our legislation. But in essence what we're talking about are goods related to Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Uh, importantly, dual use goods are certainly included and that uh, is where things can start to get complicated for Australian exporters. For Australian autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran, our definition of export sanctioned goods uh, is a fair bit broader. This is a good example of the UNSC being willing to go so far in imposing sanctions against a particular country, in this case Iran, uh, and the Australian government together with our like-minded wanting to go a bit further, and we've done that through autonomous sanctions. So export sanctioned goods for our autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran include arms or related material, which is itself defined broadly, are goods related to chemical and biological weapons. Specified goods related to the oil, gas and petrochemical industries. Our specified graphite raw materials and semi-finished metals. And specified software for integrating industrial processes. Uh, those last two dash points, uh, the graphite et al and the software, uh, represent our most recent amendments to autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran. Those measures came into effect on the 24th of January. Uh, once again, dual-use goods are included, and again, it's in that area of dual-use goods that Australian exporters um, uh, may need to consult us and, and may find it a bit complicated. Turning then to another of the sanctions measures that uh, uh, is included in both UNSC and Australian autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran, the provision of a sanctions service. Uh, a sanctions service includes the provision of technical assistance or training, uh, a finan financial assistance, a financial service, uh, or another service if it assists with or is provided in relation to a military activity, a sanctioned supply using the definition that we, we just talked through, the manufacture or use of export sanctioned goods, or gold, precious metals and diamonds. And of course all of those services we're talking about in Iran. Turning to the prohibition on dealing with designated persons and entities, another one that is included both in UNSC sanctions and Australian autonomous sanctions. A person is generally prohibited from directly or indirectly making an asset available to or for the benefit of a designated person or entity, a person or entity acting on behalf of or at the direction of a designated person or entity, or an entity owned or controlled by a designated person or entity. Uh, importantly, asset for these purposes is defined uh, very broadly. It includes an asset or property of any kind, whether tangible or intangible, movable or immovable. So in essence, we're talking about any sort of transfer to a designated person or entity. Again, just to note the, the breadth of this prohibition, it extends to indirectly making an asset available uh, to an entity that is merely owned or controlled by a designated person or entity. That rather begs the question of who or what is a designated person or entity. Uh, again, there are some differences for UNSC sanctions, and we've gone a bit further with our autonomous sanctions. For UNSC sanctions in relation to Iran, we're talking about persons or entities 
designated by the UNSC Iran Sanctions Committee. And for our autonomous sanctions, we're talking about persons or entities that the Minister for Foreign Affairs is satisfied have contributed to Iran's nuclear or missile programs uh, or assisted Iran to breach UNSC resolutions. We hopefully make this easier to navigate by providing a consolidated list on our website of all designated persons and entities uh, for the purposes of all UNSC and all Australian autonomous sanctions regimes. Uh, we also make available on our website a software program called Link Match Lite. Uh, it's a data matching program. It can help you if you have a person's name in front of you, for example, uh, to check if that person is included on the list. Turning to another of our common sanctions measures, uh, the prohibition on using a controlled asset. Uh, once again, included both in UNSC and Australian autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran. Uh, a person who holds a controlled asset is prohibited from using or dealing with it uh, or allowing or facilitating it to be used or dealt with. And a controlled asset for these purposes is an asset that is owned or controlled by a designated person or entity um, or those various persons who are associated with designated persons or entities. Um, as again, I know is familiar to a number of you in the room, this prohibition is particularly relevant to the financial sector. The final, final uh, particular measure that I'll discuss is the general prohibition on financial transactions with Iran valued at $20,000 or more. Um, as I mentioned earlier, not formally a sanctions measure. These transactions are prohibited if a party to the transaction is an individual who is physically present in Iran or a corporation incorporated in Iran. Uh, we have no measure like this in relation to any, any country other than Iran, so this is something you only need to be concerned about uh, if you are undertaking financial transactions with an Iranian party. From our perspective in DFAT, it gives us visibility of a very wide range of financial transactions. And uh, we then uh, not only consider approving the financial transaction valued at over $20,000, but we can look at the transaction in its totality from a broader sanctions compliance viewpoint. Uh, so it's become quite a valuable sanctions compliance tool for us. Uh, enough of talking about restrictions on business. Let me turn to the third part of my presentation and, and talking about how you might be able to obtain a sanctions permit to undertake an activity that would otherwise contravene sanctions. Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, in some cases her delegate, can issue sanctions permits. Uh, she may attach conditions to a sanctions permit. Uh, and importantly, we get quite a few questions from business on this point. Um, a permit may cover several identical or similar activities uh, over a, a period of time. So for example, if you understand in the next, let's say, two years, um, you expect to be undertaking 10 or more transactions with the same party in Iran following the same financial path, or maybe a selection of only two or three financial paths, we can give you a permit for those multiple trades over the course of a two-year period. I'm very happy to talk to you about how that works specifically on a case-by-case -case basis, but please bear that in mind, you don't need to be coming to us for each and every trade. Uh, different sanctions regimes have different criteria which must be satisfied before the minister or her delegate can consider granting a permit. Uh, as you might expect, those criteria for UNSC sanctions regimes are set by the UNSC and we are once again courtesy of our international legal obligations obliged to implement those in Australia. And uh, the risk of sounding like a broken record is not formally a sanctions measure, but uh, the DFAT secretary or his delegate may grant a permit authorizing a financial transaction of $20,000 or more with Iran. And if you're looking at a particular trade with Iran that might constitute a sanctioned supply, it might also involve a financial <coughs> transaction worth $20,000 or more, we'll roll that into the one permit if we're able to grant you a permit. 
Uh, so you'll have one bit of paper that will cover you off for the various measures that you might need cover for. <coughs> To give you a sense of the sorts of criteria that may need to be satisfied uh, before we can look at granting a sanctions permit, and I'll continue with Iran as a case study. For UNSC sanctions, uh, the Minister may issue a permit authorising a sanction supply to Iran, including if uh, the contract includes appropriate end user guarantees. Uh, the Iranian government um, has given particular undertakings to the Australian government. Uh, and the trade has been approved by the UNSC Iran Sanctions Committee. You'll immediately appreciate that that's a pretty high bar to reach, uh, and it probably won't surprise you to hear that we don't grant a huge number of sanctions permits for a sanction supply to Iran. I should also add that this is at the absolute upper end of the scale of complexity of the criteria that may need to be satisfied, um, and it reflects the breadth of UNSC sanctions in relation to Iran and the particular concerns that the Security Council has about Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Uh, the good news is that for Australian autonomous sanctions in relation to Iran, it is significantly more straightforward for us to grant a sanctions permit for a sanction supply. Uh, the only criterion that the Minister needs to consider is whether she considers it would be in the national interest to grant such a permit. Uh, if you remember back to the, the basis of Australian autonomous sanctions, that they are an instrument of Australian foreign policy, uh, just as we can impose them in a fairly straightforward way, it then makes sense that we can also grant permits in a fairly straightforward way uh, if it is consistent with Australian foreign policy. While I'm using Iran as a case study, I'll also note that national interest is generally the only criterion for uh, a permit to be granted under any of our autonomous sanctions regimes. There are one or two exceptions, but it's, uh, it's a good rule of thumb. For a financial transaction permit, uh, the DFAT secretary uh, or his delegate may authorise a financial transaction of $20,000 or more if he considers it appropriate to do so. And that's the fundamental criteria that we apply. Uh, but the Secretary will have regard to whether the transaction fits under one of these five headings. Uh, the one I'd really draw your attention to is the, the fourth dot point, which refers to a significant trade transaction that, if not completed, would have an adverse effect on Australia's trade relationship with Iran or the viability of an Australian business. And we're pretty uh, liberal in how we, we interpret those terms. Turning to the fourth part of my presentation then, to talk about uh, the serious criminal offences that are established by Australian sanctioned laws. Contravening a sanctions measure or a condition of a sanctions permit uh, is a serious criminal offence. It's punishable for individuals by up to 10 years in prison uh, and or a fine the greater of $425,000 uh, or three times the value of the transaction if that can be calculated. These offences are punishable for bodies corporate by a fine the greater of $1.7 million or again three times the value of the transaction where that can be worked out. Importantly, these offences are strict liability offences for bodies corporate. They are not for individuals, but they are for bodies corporate. Meaning that it's, it's not necessary to prove any fault element, uh, be it intent, knowledge, recklessness or negligence, for a body corporate to be found guilty. All that a court would need to be satisfied of is that the body corporate had uh, undertaken the conduct, regardless of the body corporate's intent. Uh, giving false or misleading information in connection with the administration of a sanction law is also a serious criminal offence. Uh, importantly, a sanctions permit is taken never to have been granted if false or misleading information was contained in the application for it. Uh, in other words, it will not only be an offence to have provided the false or misleading information, but any trades that you may have undertaken thinking you were relying upon a permit, in actual fact that permit was not in place, so those trades would very likely constitute offences under themselves as well. And this offence of providing false and misleading information is also punishable by up to 10 years in prison and or a fine 
of $425,000. Uh, these offences apply broadly. Uh, they apply, um, as you would expect, to any activity in Australia, but also to any Australian anywhere in the world. So please do consider your offshore activities. And to any person using an Australian flag vessel or aircraft. Uh, again, not formally a sanctions measure, but providing services in relation to an unauthorized financial transaction of $20,000 or more with Iran uh, is an offense for a financial institution, a uh, reporting entity in the language of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counterterrorism Financing Act and regulations. And each transaction that is processed um, without the requisite authorization is punishable by a fine of $8,500. Uh, we in DFAT do have some investigative powers to determine if a sanctions offence may have been committed. Of course, the primary investigative agency for the Commonwealth Government is the Australian Federal Police, and we do at a certain point refer matters to the AFP, but we can get the ball rolling with some powers that, that we have. Uh, DFAT may issue a notice requiring a person to give information or documents, including under oath for the purpose of determining whether a sanction law has been or is being complied with. Uh, these notices are quite a powerful tool. The person must comply regardless of any other law uh, and regardless of whether the information might tend to self-incriminate uh, him or her. Uh, failure to comply with one of these notices is itself an offence punishable by 12 months in prison. Uh, every once in a while we do issue one of these notices and it comes as a bit of a surprise to the person in whose letterbox it arrives. Uh, but in fact, more often than not, it would be a good 80% of the time, uh, we issue these notices at the request of an Australian business. Uh, there's a number of instances where Australian businesses have come across information that they think would be of interest for us, uh, but for legal reasons, for commercial reasons, for reputational reasons, they're a little reluctant to simply hand it across uh, to DFAT. In those circumstances, um, by all means, do contact us. Uh, if you would like us to issue one of these notices, we're always very happy to do so. It provides legal coverage for the business to provide that information to DFAT. Um, we're, of course, very appreciative of receiving any information that you may have. Uh, so it's, it's a win-win for, for all concerned. So please do keep that in mind as, as a tool that, that is available. And I, I should note that's really uh, indicative of our broader approach to uh, administering Australian sanction laws. Uh, of course, we will resort to investigating uh, non-compliance. Uh, we will resort to making referrals to the AFP and, and pursuing prosecutions where we have to. Um, but we're much more about having these sort of sessions, having dialogue with business, talking things through, uh, than we are about wrapping up the prosecutions. Um, so uh, if you do come across something you'd like to talk it through, please do feel free to get in touch. Uh, importantly, there are a number of defences to sanctions offences. Uh, there are, of course, the range of regular defences that you find as a matter of general Australian criminal law in the Criminal Code. But there is one defence that is specific to Australian sanctions offences. Uh, it's also specific to bodies of corporate. So it's a defence for a body corporate if it proves that it took reasonable precautions and exercised due diligence to avoid contravening a sanctions measure or a condition of a sanctions permit. Uh, and I often say in these presentations that if you walk away remembering two phrases, that will be two phrases that are very familiar to you in the business context, uh, make them reasonable precautions and due diligence. What constitutes those two phrases uh, will depend on the circumstances. Uh, again, this I imagine will be familiar to many of you. It's very difficult to define these things in a general way. Uh, they really are very context specific and trade specific. But uh, as a bottom line, a body corporate would certainly have to demonstrate that it thoroughly considered sanctions issues before undertaking an activity. And one tool to think about is to consider including terms related to sanctions in any contract uh, related to an activity. So if you are exporting goods overseas, include terms in the contract uh, binding the end user not to on-sell them in a way that may contravene Australian sanction laws. Uh, 
that will go a good way down the road towards satisfying due diligence <coughs> and reasonable precautions. Naturally, please also inform us immediately of any changes to an activity that may raise sanctions issues that uh, hitherto were, were not obvious. Uh, finally then, to wrap up, uh, let me run through really the crux of what it is that Australian businesses need to know and do when it comes to sanctions. Uh, firstly, when you're planning an activity, please do consider whether it may involve any country, any good or service, or any person or entity uh, subject to these sanctions. You can find uh, full details of all UNSC and all Australian autonomous sanctions regimes on our website at the address on this slide. Uh, we've recently completely rejigged our website, incidentally. Uh, we hope it's now much easier to use. We certainly think it is, and I very much welcome any feedback on that front. Please also think about checking the consolidated list, again available on our website, of all persons and entities who are subject to all UNSC and Australian Autonomous Sanctions regimes. If you have any concerns that an activity may contravene a sanctions measure in an Australian sanctioned law, uh, please consider seeking legal advice to assess whether the activity may be, may be prohibited without a sanctions permit. Uh, sounds a bit trite to say it, but of course the onus to comply with Australian sanction laws, as with Australian criminal law more generally, um, rests on the community at large. Uh, in contentious cases, you can submit um, what we call an informal inquiry to DFAT, relating to whether you require a sanctions permit for the activity that you're thinking about. You can do that using the online sanctions administration system, or OSIS, which is available on our website. I just note here that um, we, the Australian Government, are only able to provide advice on Australian sanction laws, but you may also, uh, when engaging in international trade, need to think about the sanction laws of other countries. Um, one to watch out for in particular is that uh, trades denominated in USD uh, will generally be regulated by US sanction laws, so you will need to be familiar with those as well. Uh, if you assess that an activity would be prohibited by an Australian sanction law without a sanctions permit, please consider whether the criteria for such a permit are met. And if you assess if those criteria are met, then you can submit a formal application, as opposed to an informal inquiry, for a sanctions permit uh, to us in DFAT, again using the online sanctions administration system. Uh, we do ask that you please don't put a formal application for a sanctions permit on our system until you've undertaken these steps. That will greatly help us to manage our caseload, which in turn greatly helps us to respond more quickly when an application is put on our system. We would ask that you please submit an application as early as possible. Uh, that said, we understand that things can happen quickly. Um, a trade may come up that you need to take advantage of in a hurry. We will always, in those circumstances, uh, use our best endeavours to meet commercial deadlines. And nine times out of ten, we're able to do that. Um, but we will get a little annoyed if uh, uh, every permit that we are granting to a particular business, we're having 24 hours notice and need to turn it around. And please, when you do come to us, include as much information as possible. We will come back to you if something is missing from your application, but of course we can move faster if everything is there up front. Uh, what does DFAT then do when we receive an application for a sanctions permit? Uh, we'll consider it as soon as we possibly can, uh, as I say, subject to our current caseload. Uh, we may need to consult some other Australian government agencies. Uh, we in DFAT are the regulators. Um, my team and I are, are lawyers. Uh, we are not the technical experts who understand if this particular widget is of concern and might be useful in a nuclear bomb. So we do need to consult our technical experts in, in other agencies from time to time. In complex cases, we may need to consult other countries who might have an interest in how the Canadians, the Europeans, the Americans have dealt with uh, a similar trade. Uh, or we might, courtesy of the criteria set by the UNSC, need to consult a UNSC sanctions committee. You'll appreciate in those complex cases, the timelines will start to uh, drag out a little, but we'll always stay in touch with you if that's the case.
Uh, importantly, we generally require complete information about an activity, and that includes the full path for any goods that you might be exporting um, from you through any intermediaries to the end user, and likewise the full path for the payment that you receive in return, again from the end user through any intermediaries uh, back to you. Uh, finally, and this is the thought I, I really want to leave you with, uh, it goes without saying that we implement Australian sanction law diligently, that is our fundamental duty as the, the sanctions regulator. Um, but please rest assured that we also do so in a way that is as trade facilitative as we can possibly manage. In practical terms, that really amounts to two things. Uh, firstly, we're always happy to discuss um, innovative and novel conditions to a sanctions permit. If there's a situation that doesn't quite gel neatly with our standard practice, we'll look at novel conditions to, to get around that. And secondly, we always seek to avoid putting Australian businesses at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis your competitors from similar countries. Again, our benchmarks are Canada, the EU, the US. So uh, if, for example, um, you hear that a Canadian company, European company, is getting an easier time from their sanctions regulator than you're getting from us, uh, please do let us know. Uh, we're happy to talk to our counterparts in those countries and, and do our utmost to create a level playing field. So for further information, um, please make your first stop our, our website, just to run through what you can find there. Uh, there are details of all UNSC and all Australian autonomous sanctions regimes. You can check that consolidated list of all designated persons and entities. Uh, you can download the LinkMatch Lite software, which will help you to check the consolidated list. You can access the online sanctions administration system to make either an informal inquiry or a formal application relating to a sanctions permit. Uh, you can also subscribe to our sanctions email list. Uh, we notify subscribers whenever the consolidated list changes. Uh, there's a lot of fiddling with sanctions regimes done in New York by the Security Council, so that amounts to a couple of emails a week. Uh, and we also notify our subscribers whenever we make significant changes to uh, autonomous sanctions regimes. <coughs> so for example, I referred to the most recent changes to our autonomous sanctions for Iran, uh, implemented on the 24th of January. We certainly informed all of our subscribers uh, about those. If our website isn't doing the trick, then you can uh, contact us via email at sanctions at dfap.gov.au. Uh, we do ask that you please use OSIS for anything that relates to a sanctions permit. If you contact us via email, our response will very likely be, please move this across to the, uh, the OSIS system. Uh, the reason for that is that when you sign into OSIS, you accept a bunch of legal terms and conditions that information you provide will be full and complete and, and so on. Uh, and that then enables us to give more definitive advice when the query comes through OSIS than if it's dealt with less formally by email. So anything to do with a sanctions permit, please use OSIS. But for any other matter, um, by all means send us an email. And uh, in particular, we're all ears when it comes to any information you might have uh, suggesting a possible contravention of Australian sanction laws. Um, with that, thank you very much again for coming and um, naturally I'm, I'm very uh, happy to take any questions.